Hi everyone, I hope you all have had a great start to your April. Today's video is another redo, this time the 1998 Thurston High School shooting executed by 15-year-old Kiplan Kinkle. This one will be much longer than my past iteration. In fact, it'll be my longest video to date. I hope that you guys find this new version more informative. I did my best to gather as much information as I possibly could, so I'm curious to see if you learn anything new about this case from my video. I really went down a rabbit hole with this one, and I probably spent at least 30 hours on the research and writing alone. So again, I hope you enjoy it. As always, if you have any information to add, or if I made a mistake anywhere, please leave it in the comments below. I will do my best to make sure anything that needs to be added is pinned. Quickly, before we get into the case, I'd like to remind you guys that I have a membership that you can join. I offer a few perks, such as the ability to watch videos 24 hours early, and even being able to pick a case or two that I cover each month. I recently changed the tiers, so make sure to take a look if you are interested. Without any further ado, let's get right into today's case. Kiplan Philip Kinkle, who also goes by Kip, was born on August 30, 1982. He was the second child, with his older sister Kristen, being five years old when he was born. Both of his parents, William and Faith, were teachers who taught Spanish at different schools, his mom at Springfield High School, and his father at Thurston High School. During the time of this case, his father had already retired, but his mother was still working. Those who knew the family reported that his parents were very loving and supportive to their two children. They were, however, said to be very smart people, and those who knew them reported that they had high expectations for their kids. Though they were always expecting the best from him, Kip later stated that he suffered no abuse whatsoever from his parents during the time he was growing up. When Kip was six years old, he and his family spent a year in Spain, where he attended a Spanish-speaking kindergarten. His older sister Kristen recalled that, despite the fact that both of their parents were Spanish teachers, Kip struggled a lot with his schooling in Spain. This may have a large part to do with the language barrier, but as we will soon find out, Kip struggled a fair amount with some aspects of his schooling regardless of the added complications of learning in a different language. Eventually, the family of four made their way back to Springfield, Oregon, where they lived full-time in a house that they had built, nestled in the woods. Kip began to attend an elementary school in a neighboring town, where he was described by his first grade teachers as underdeveloped, both physically and emotionally. Kip's teachers recommended to his parents that he retake the first grade, as he was not at the level he should have been at by this point. Being teachers themselves, Kip's parents understood how important it was for their children to do well in school, and they wanted to do what was best for him, so they had him retake the grade. As I'm sure you can imagine, this was very hard on Kip. He was reportedly frustrated because everyone else in his family seemed to excel, while he struggled immensely. According to later interviews with Kristen, she said that no one else in the family had difficulty with school to the extent that Kip did. It was also tough for him to watch all of his friends advance to the next grade, while he was forced to stay behind. Kip got through his second year of first grade, and was finally able to move on to the second grade. Kip's second grade teacher recalled that he was an average student in terms of his behavior, stating that he didn't have any major disciplinary problems. She did, however, agree that Kip struggled heavily when it came to his writing. He was apparently having a lot of issues with his motor skills, and spelling in particular. According to PBS.org, Kip even had trouble spelling his own last name, and that his level of anxiety as well as frustration during this time was abnormally high. The site also reports that it got to the point where his parents were concerned that he may have an undiagnosed learning disability. He apparently did not meet the requirements to be tested, so he continued his schooling as normal. Kip's parents were reportedly helping him as much as they could with his schoolwork, and they continued this habit throughout his life. During the next few years, Kip's intelligence really started to shine. Despite his difficulty with writing, he excelled in math and science. He was even placed in a gifted and talented program for these subjects during fourth grade. 
In the same grade, PBS.org reports that Kip was finally diagnosed with a learning disability. They don't state which one it was exactly, but I did read on other sources that he had been diagnosed with dyslexia at some point, so I believe this is what it was. Not much is reported about his life during the next few grades, so we are just going to skip on ahead to right before Kip started middle school. Kip's first rifle was gifted to him on his 12th birthday from his father. His interest in them had been growing for a while, but his parents weren't completely on board at first. According to Kristen's later interviews, up until the point he got a gun, the Kinkles were very anti-anything to do with violence. Ultimately, after serious debate and outside perspective from family friends, they made the decision to get him a gun. According to OregonLive.com, Kip's father was hoping that he could channel his fascination for firearms in a positive way. His parents couldn't have known at the time that Kip was severely struggling with his mental health. If they did, I'm sure they would have made a different decision. When later speaking to examining psychiatrists, Kip told them that he had been hearing voices in his head ever since he was 12 years old. He described these voices as Voice A, who would insist that Kip commit violent acts. Voice B, who constantly insulted Kip, often telling him to commit suicide. And Voice C, who continually repeated what Voice A and B said. According to HuffPost.com, Kip stated that the first time he heard one, it was a male voice that said, quote, you need to kill everyone everyone in the world. From there, the voice continued, but soon it multiplied into the three distinct voices that would torment Kip day and night. He recalled that the voices often talked very to each other about Kip, as if he couldn't hear them. He stated that they would continuously belittle and mock him. Kip didn't want anyone to know about the voices, so he did his absolute best to not display any symptoms that would cause people to catch on. And it worked. No one in his life seemed to notice that he was going through this. Kip later said in an interview that he finally landed on an explanation for the voices, quote, I believe that the Disney Corporation was working in conjunction with the US government, and they had planted a chip in my head, and so the voices were coming from this chip. According to his interview, another part of this was that he apparently became obsessed with the theory that foreign invaders were plotting to take over America. This is the reason he claimed as to why he went on to gain such an interest in owning many guns and wanting to know how to make his own bombs. I'm only going to touch on the chip and foreign invader aspect here, since no other sources that I found have any information regarding this, so just keep it in the back of your mind. Moving on, it was around this time in his life that Kip's older sister, Kristen, went off to college in Hawaii. Her departure was tough on Kip. According to Kristen, she was somewhat of a mediator between Kip and their parents, since there was such a large age gap between them. Apparently, when she left, his relationship with his mom and dad became a little strained. Kip was also said to be getting bullied at school. He told people around him that other kids would push him around and even shove his face into the water at the water fountain. Kip was eventually enrolled in karate and his parents hoped that these classes would help boost his self-esteem. He was a very small kid, so this helped him learn how to defend himself a little better. He took the classes for a few months, but ultimately stopped attending. As kids usually do when they reach their preteen and teen years, Kip started to act out. When he was in seventh grade, he and a few friends ordered some how to make homemade bombs books from their school's computer and had them shipped to the school. When they arrived, Kip and his friends were caught immediately. Kip's parents obviously found out about this and were very concerned. They began to question if the kids that Kip was hanging out with were good influences. As we will find out, Kip ended up getting a hold of these books one way or another. They would be found in his things years after the fact. Kip got into even more trouble at school, so his parents made the decision to pull him out of school early and homeschool him for the remaining two and a half months of seventh grade. Kip's behavior continued to go downhill from there because in the next year, he was caught stealing from a local store. Kip also began to exhibit a far more intense fascination with firearms and explosives around this time. He would assemble his own gasoline bombs and set them off in a quarry for fun. But it only got worse. On January 4th, 1997, 14-year-old Kip and a friend were arrested two and a half hours away from Springfield in Bend, Oregon, while on a snowboarding trip. The arrest came after one of them threw a 12-inch wide rock off of an overpass, and it struck an occupied car below. Kip was adamant that he wasn't the one to actually send the rock over, that he was just there at the time. 
Despite his claims, he got into a lot of trouble over this, which set into motion a few drastic actions by his parents. Kip's relationship with his father was already suffering at this point due to his difficult behavior, but by now it had started to deteriorate fast. William was at his wit's end over Kip's troublesome actions, and it understandably put a massive strain on their relationship. The Bend arrest, along with his prior concerning behavior, led his parents to seek out professional help. Kip's mother in particular was really starting to worry about him. His actions were becoming a major problem, and paired with uncontrollable anger, it was a recipe for disaster. The fact that Kip was also showing an interest in guns and explosives made Faith even more insistent on pursuing help for him. It got so bad that his parents felt forced to enroll him in anger management classes, and even had him evaluated by a psychologist, whose name was Jeffrey Hicks. Faith went with Kip to see Dr. Hicks, but his father never did. According to Dr. Hicks, they discussed this, and he came to the conclusion that William was not convinced that seeing a psychologist would help. The sessions spanned over the course of six months. During the meetings, Kip talked about his home life, and a lot about how he felt he wasn't good enough for his parents. He apparently became fearful when discussing his relationship with his father. Kip stated that his mother saw him as a good kid with bad habits, while his father saw him as a bad kid with bad habits. Kip was careful with his words, because he didn't want to be labeled as mentally ill, but he occasionally slipped up, sometimes stating to Dr. Hicks that he had no motivation to do anything, mentioning that eating had become a chore. According to Dr. Hicks, Kip showed no symptoms of delusional thinking or other thought disorder symptoms. We know based on Kip's later statements that this is far from the truth, but he must have been good at hiding the signs. Kip was eventually diagnosed with clinical depression and was prescribed Prozac. His father was also advised to take it easy on Kip. In addition to Dr. Hicks, Kip was also taken to the Skipworth Juvenile Facility to meet with another psychologist, Dr. John Crumbly. This was mainly as a result of Kip's arrest in Bend. According to Dr. Crumbly, Kip's parents were exceptional. He thought that their many actions to get him help and forcing him to take responsibility for his behavior was impressive. Dr. Crumbly also stated that Kip was not a typical delinquent teen like he was used to treating. Apparently, Kip was quite remorseful following the incident and responded well to the consequences of his actions. It was finally decided that Kip would have to complete 32 hours of community service for his part in the crime. He also was made to write an apology letter and pay for the damages that the rock caused to the car. Dr. Crumbly did not see any major anomalies with either Kip or his family in general. After about nine sessions with Dr. Hicks, Kip's treatment was discontinued because Dr. Hicks, as well as Kip's parents, felt that he was in a much better place. Kip, however, continued the Prozac prescription. Kristen later said, quote, I remember my mom calling me very excited, telling me that Kip is doing so much better. The psychologist even said, you don't even have to come see me anymore. You're doing that much better. About two or three months later, his condition apparently improved enough that Kip wanted to discontinue the Prozac, which his parents and Dr. Hicks agreed to. Even though the psychologist didn't see any major problems with Kip, he was indeed starting to go down a rough path, which will become evident soon. His behavioral issues at school continued and started to get more and more violent. According to HeraldTimesOnline.com, Kinkle would talk to friends about harming cats and would often brag about making pipe bombs. I was unable to figure out exactly when this happened, but sometime around the age of 14 or 15, Kip was suspended from school for two days after he kicked another student in the head. The other student apparently either shoved him or called him a name, which angered Kip. It's reported that not too long after, Kip was suspended once again, this time for three days, after he threw a pencil at another student. By the age of 15, Kip owned two more guns, a 9mm Glock handgun and a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle, both of which were given to him by his father. Accounts vary greatly on when exactly he received both of these guns, but all state that he owned them by this age. The guns were given to Kip under the condition that he used them safely and never without supervision. According to OregonLive.com, Kip soon broke this deal, as the neighbors heard him firing them off in the backyard with nobody present. Kip's father, William, promptly took the firearms away and locked them in a gun safe which he stored under he and his wife's bed, with the key kept around his neck. Kip eventually graduated from middle school and moved on to high school. 
It's reported that over the summer of 1997, Kip acquired another gun, this time a 22 caliber Ruger Mark II pistol. This was a little hard to narrow down, because according to PBS.org, Kip's parents were completely unaware that he now owned a fourth gun. Other sources claim, however, that William was the one to buy Kip this handgun as well. I'm sorry that I'm not able to give you guys a clearer version of events. Either way, it's important to know that he now had moderately easy access to four firearms. When the next school year came around, Kip was enrolled at Thurston High School, where his father had previously taught Spanish. His father thought it would be a good idea to have Kip join the school's football team. He made the team, which could have been because of his father's connections and reputation with the school. He was a scrawny kid and made it known that he wanted to start working out so he could be bigger. It's reported that Kip had been in a relationship with a girl around this time. Apparently, their relationship came to an end sometime his freshman year of high school. Strangely, there is little to no information surrounding this relationship, so I'm going to assume it wasn't very serious. However, in later journal entries recovered by authorities, Kip speaks about a girl he seemed to be close with. Though it isn't 100% clear who he is talking about in his notes, the tone and subject of the writings lead me to believe they were about this ex-girlfriend. Moving on, Kip's fellow classmates described his behavior as odd and morbid. He apparently constantly spoke about committing violent acts, even telling his classmates that he was going to join the army after graduating so he could know what it was like to kill someone. Obviously, Kip was dealing with a lot of concerning issues. He was showing signs of paranoid schizophrenia, with the voices that he had been hearing definitely supporting this. The voices got nastier as time went on, and it was getting harder for Kip to ignore them. He continued doing his best to hide the signs in fear of being labeled a freak. A little bit into his freshman year, Kip reportedly gave an extensive how to make a bomb speech in class. I read that another student gave a speech on how to join the Church of Satan, so I guess Kip's topic wasn't too out of the ordinary. I'll be honest, I'm a little confused as to why Kip wasn't looked at further following his speech. It seems wildly concerning that a freshman in high school was able to not only make a detailed report about how to construct a bomb in the first place, but was allowed to present it as well. While it's true that school shootings and similar attacks weren't as common in 1998 as they are today, they were nowhere near unheard of. The number of incidents that occurred in the 1990s depends on the source, but it's safe to say that there were over 100 school shootings that took place in the 90s alone. I find it strange that no one thought to look into him as a threat to the school. Anyway, Kip also apparently read from his journal in a literature class, sharing his plans to kill everybody. I will go into more detail about his journal entries later in the video, so stay tuned for that. No sources that I was able to find state that Kip got into any sort of trouble over these two presentations. I wasn't able to find out if he was even talked to regarding these two incidents. In fact, I did read that when the school superintendent was asked about why they didn't suspend Kinkle after this, he said, quote, If we detained every student who said, I'm going to kill someone, we would have a large number of students detained. According to PBS.com, one of Kip's friends claimed that he was intrigued by shootings that had taken place in the recent months. His friend said, quote, He reacted to the other school shootings, their shortcomings almost, how they failed. He talked about how, not that he'd do it that exact way, like, go to school and shoot people. But if he was going to go out, he would try to take as many people out with him. And also, if he was going to shoot people, like at a school, that he'd kill himself. And he couldn't believe that the other kids didn't just shoot themselves, instead of sitting there and being arrested. That's what he'd say. It was somewhere around this time that Kip started complaining to his friends that his parents were trying to take all of his guns away. Kip's violent thoughts showed themselves more and more as the year went on. Students recall that Kip's notebooks were covered in drawings of guns, bombs, and other violent images. Looking back, it is beyond clear that Kip was dealing with some severe mental issues. He stated himself that he did whatever he could to hide the signs from those around him, so I'm not surprised that more people, including his psychologists, didn't pick up on them. I just wish he had gotten help for this, and it didn't turn into the tragedy that soon unfolded. Now, let's move on to the events that make this case so well known. On Wednesday, May 20th, 1998, Kip met up with a friend at school to buy a stolen Beretta Model 90 32 caliber handgun. After paying $110, Kip took the gun and put it in his locker. 
The handgun belonged to another schoolmate's dad, Scott Keeney, and was reported missing the same day. Scott gave police a list of names of students who may have been involved, and despite Kip not being on the list, he was eventually questioned anyway. Kip was checked for weapons, and stated, quote, Look, I'm gonna be square with you guys. The gun's in my locker. Authorities found the fully loaded handgun, right where he said it would be. Clearly, Kip was immediately suspended from Thurston High School, pending an expulsion hearing. Kip and the friend who sold the gun to him were both arrested and taken to the police station. There, he was fingerprinted, photographed, and charged with possession of a firearm in a public building, along with a felony charge of receiving a stolen weapon. According to Al Worthen, the detective who interviewed Kip, he was extremely worried about what his parents were going to think of him. He was also reportedly scared that his parents would be embarrassed of his behavior when their friends and neighbors found out. His parents were respected members of the community, and like stated before, they expected great things out of their kids. It's not difficult to understand why Kip would be so nervous about them finding out. A few hours later, Kip was released from police custody and driven home by his father. On the way home, his father, William, reportedly told Kip that he would be sent to military school if he did not clean his act up. Kip later stated that he barely heard his father on the drive because the voices in his head were booming. On the way home, the two of them stopped to get food at Burger King. Kip later stated that while inside of the building, his father turned to him and said, quote, you disgust me, before leaving Kip alone in the restaurant. At that moment, the voices that Kip had been hearing started telling him to get his rifle and kill his father. Some sources claim that the conversation about sending him away later took place at home. The only thing that matters is that Kip got a hard talking to from his father. While it's not known exactly what happened when they got home, those who knew the family stated that they wouldn't be surprised if William came down hard on Kip for his actions. Scott Keeney, the one who owned the stolen gun, called William later that afternoon when he heard Kip had been arrested. According to him, their conversation revolved around Kip's intense and out-of-control behavior. William reportedly told Scott, quote, I don't know what to do at this point. From here on out, I will be referring to Kip as Kinkle. At around 3 p.m. the same day, Kinkle retrieved his 22 caliber rifle from his room, as well as ammunition from his parents' room. He then proceeded through the home to the kitchen where his dad was sitting and drinking coffee. Without warning, Kinkle shot his dad once in the back of the head. In his later interrogation, Kip recalled the events that led up to the death of his father. I had no other choice. He was saying all this. He was saying, he was saying all that stuff. He was, kind of, he, was, he was saying a lot of negative stuff about you. Like, what, what was he saying about you? <laughs> okay. He's mad at you because you got caught in school with the gun, right? Right. Okay. And I. <laughs> he's... Okay. All his friends and everything knew my. <laughs> okay. So he was feeling ashamed and embarrassed because, because you did something wrong. Is that right? <laughs> Okay. I didn't want to. I love my dad. That's why. <laughs> you love him, so that's why you had to kill him. So what's he doing in the kitchen when when you when you come in? He was drinking something. I don't know. Okay. Was his back to you? Yes. <laughs> Earlier you told me you you walked up behind him and shot him in the head. Is that right? Basically, yeah. Basically? Yeah. Did you stand away from him when you shot yeah. him? Yeah. How far were you from him when you shot him? Oh, ten feet. Ten feet. And how many times did you shoot him? One. And where did that bullet hit him? Right above the ear. Right behind the ear? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my god. Sorry. <laughs> he then went into his actions immediately following. 
I didn't know what to do, so I dragged, dragged him into the, the bathroom and then put a white sheet over him. Okay. Oh my God. My parents were good people. I just so fucked up in the head. I don't know why. <laughs> After he moved his dad's body, Kinkle reportedly took the key from around his father's neck and retrieved his other firearms from the gun safe. Kinkle then joined a conference call with two of his friends from school. He told them that he did not know that the gun he tried to purchase was stolen and was worried about how his parents were going to handle the situation. He then told his friends that he had a stomach ache and was waiting for his mom to get home. According to one of the friends on the phone, Kinkle kept saying, quote, Where's my mom? When is she going to be home? Apparently on this call, Kinkle also repeated things like, it's over, everything's over, it's done, nothing matters now. It's important to note that Kinkle's confession was a bit contradictory on the retelling of this. He said at first that he got onto the call with his friends after he killed his dad, but later stated that he hadn't killed his dad prior to getting on the phone going off of the fact that he was reportedly acting extremely odd on this call, and also that most sources, including official court documents, claim the call took place after his father's death. I'm going to go with that. Kinkle's mother, Faith, was completely unaware of the events that transpired that day. She didn't know that he had been suspended from school, that he'd been arrested and charged with a felony, and she surely had no idea that she was coming home to a dead husband and a murderous son. After getting off of the call with his friends, Kinkle sat in the upstairs window and watched the driveway, waiting for his mom to get home. So your mom comes home around six? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, I've never been to your house. So, and earlier you talked about a basement. Is that a garage that's underneath the house? Or? Yeah. Okay. So your mom drives in in her car, right? Yeah. What is she driving? Explore. Explore? Yeah. And she parks. Where are you at? I was waiting for her. Okay. Outside or inside? Inside. Okay. She pull into the garage? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. Do you have one of these items? When his mom did finally arrive home around six thirty PM. Kinkle met her down in the garage. So, you told me that your mom gets out of the Explorer and starts up the stairs from the garage or basement, is that right? Yes. Do you say anything to her? Yes, I told her I loved her. And then you said, yes. God damn it, he pushes his butt out of head! All right, thank you. Yep. 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 Settle down. Settle down. It's all right. It's all right. Just settle down, okay? All right, just settle down. Several times. Because I, I, I dragged her out into the basement and was trying to shot her. And, and she seemed like she was still alive. And I said that I loved her. And I shot her. I shot her again so she would know that I killed her. Because of my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so you didn't want your mom to know that you were the one that was shot at her. Right. Okay. <laughs> and you love your mom. <laughs> Kinkle shot his mom twice in the back of the head as she was walking up the stairs. He then dragged her body out into the open and shot her three times in the face and once in the heart. After she was finally dead, he also went on to cover her body with a white sheet. He left her body in the garage and went upstairs. Kinkle then went on to describe his night after he killed both of his parents. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I held, okay. held my clock to my head. And I wanted to kill myself so bad. But I couldn't. I don't know why. So did you get any sleep last night at all, or did you stay awake all night? Stayed awake. Oh. Did you watch TV? What, what? I turned on a huge company, but I didn't watch it. All throughout the next morning, May 21st, 1998, Kinkle reportedly played a recording of Liebestod, a song from Romeo and Juliet, which he had watched recently in one of his classes. The volume was left on high and played on loop until police later showed up. Kip eventually left the house, driving his mother's green Ford Explorer to Thurston High School, where he was suspended from the day before. Kinkle arrived at about 7.45 a.m. and parked the vehicle near the school's tennis courts. He then made his way on foot to the campus and was caught on security footage as he approached the building. He was armed with a total of five weapons, two hunting knives, his Ruger 22 caliber rifle, his 9mm Glock 19, and his 22 caliber Ruger Mark II pistol. He was also carrying over 1,000 rounds of ammunition in a backpack. In preparation, Kinkle had taped a few rounds to his chest, in the event that he ran out of ammo before he got the chance to end his own life, which he wholeheartedly planned on doing. All of the weapons he brought were hidden under a trench coat that he was wearing. Kinkle finally made it to the door, and entered the building just before 8 a.m. He began his path down the hallway, towards the school's cafeteria, passing a few students in the process. During a later walkthrough of the school with police, Kinkle stated that he told one of his friends that they'd better get out of there. Unfortunately, I am unable to include the walkthrough footage in this video, but I will have it linked in the description if you want to watch it for yourself. According to a student, Brian Mabe, he overheard Kinkle warn the other student to leave. Brian recalled this experience, saying, quote, Adam didn't know it was Kip until Kip turned around and was like, Okay, you need to get out of here, Adam. Something bad is going to happen. And Adam was just like, What are you talking about? And Kip was just, not an expression on his face. And Adam goes, What are you going to do? Brian then watched as Kinkle pulled his rifle out from under his trench coat, turned around, and fired, hitting two students in the process. One of them was 16-year-old Ben Walker, who was holding hands with and talking to his girlfriend when he was shot in the back of the head. Ben ended up in the intensive care unit at the hospital, but was sadly brain dead. Ben unfortunately did not make it. The other student was 17-year-old Ryan Atterbury. He was shot in the cheek, and the bullet traveled through his jaw, hitting his spinal cord, and ultimately stopping near the back of his neck. Miraculously, he wasn't permanently paralyzed, and actually made a full recovery after spending a few days in the hospital. Back to the shooting, 911 calls began to flood into local dispatchers, with many people frantically begging for help. Kinkle then advanced to the school's cafeteria, where in less than a minute, he fired the remaining 48 rounds that were loaded into his rifle. In this burst, 25 students were wounded. One student, 17-year-old Mikhail Nikolasin, was reportedly crawling under a table when Kinkle walked up behind him and shot him point-blank in the head, killing him instantly. Kinkle then approached and held the barrel of his rifle up to another student named Ryan Crowley's head and pulled the trigger. The rifle clicked, as it was now out of ammo. Kinkle attempted to reload. That was when a wounded student, Jacob Riker, took the opportunity to subdue Kinkle. Jacob closed the distance between himself and Kinkle and tackled him to the ground. Several other students joined in to assist Jacob. 
Jacob later stated that he tripped on his run towards Kinkle. However, I didn't see any other mention of this, so I'm not sure exactly what happened, if he fell, or just kind of stumbled. Either way, I just wanted to quickly throw it in here. With Jacob now on top of him, Kinkle was able to draw the Glock that he had hidden in his belt and fire a single shot before he was disarmed. This shot hit the already injured Jacob, as well as another student. Kinkle then reportedly shouted, quote, just kill me, at the surrounding students. He was held in place until the police arrived. I read that when authorities got there, one of the students that was on top of Kinkle got up and punched him in the face. In total, 37 of his rounds struck innocent students, with two passing away due to their injuries. Thankfully, Jacob made a full recovery from his wounds he sustained in the shooting. I also wanted to point out that the shooting took place on his birthday. Kinkle described his thought process during the shooting in his later interrogation. Why did you go to school and, sh and start shooting people? I had to. I had no other choice. I couldn't do anything else. Had you been stopped by a police officer before you'd gotten to school, would you have done that? I don't know. Okay. Why did you feel that you didn't have a choice with the kids at school? I don't know. I can't. My head is static. I have to. I have to. Okay. <laughs> Was there any kids that were in that group of people that you were seeing that you singled out as any one target? No. Do you know the names of any of those kids that you shot no. at? Kinkle was apprehended, and while in custody, he attacked Al Worthen, the detective who interviewed him the day before, and the one interviewing him in his interrogation. When we got here to the police department, you had a knife that the officers had missed strapped to your leg, right? Right. And you slipped your cuffs around to the front. And when I opened the door, you held that knife out and you charged me with that knife. Yes. Why did you do that? I want you to shoot me. I just want to die. Okay. I can't. Was that the right thing or the wrong thing to do? It has to be the right thing because I need to die more than anything else. Unable to commit suicide, Kinkle was hoping that attacking Al would lead to him being fatally shot, thus granting his wish of death. Instead, he was pepper sprayed and subdued once again. He was then interviewed by Al Worthen before heading off to jail. While he was behind bars, Kinkle was placed on suicide watch for obvious reasons. This didn't stop him from attempting to kill himself though, as he reportedly starved himself in order to die. Shortly after the shooting, authorities went by the Kinkle residence. As they approached the home, they heard the song that Kinkle left playing blasting from inside of the house. It's such an eerie feeling to imagine walking into a house where the inhabitants have been murdered and hearing opera music playing on loop. Police made entry and found hundreds of 22 caliber bullets strewn across the floor in one section of the house. As they made their way through the home, they found a door that was locked. After picking the lock with a paperclip, police discovered William Kinkle's body lying motionless under a blood-stained white sheet in the bathroom. They continued through the home, eventually locating the staircase down to the garage. There they found Faith Kinkle's lifeless body, also covered in a white sheet. Kristen at the time was still in Hawaii attending college, so she had to be informed over phone call that her parents were deceased and that her younger brother had shot up his high school. She later stated, quote, I remember turning on the TV and seeing my house, the house I grew up in, from a helicopter view. She made her way back to Oregon, but was unable to return to her childhood home due to the investigation. Kristen, who was only 21 years old at the time, had to plan both of her parents' funerals. Let's jump back to the investigation at the Kinkle residence. While searching Kinkle's room, investigators found what they thought was a homemade bomb. They immediately vacated the residence and evacuated the houses nearby. A bomb squad was tasked with clearing the home 
and they found at least five explosive devices during their search. According to HeraldTimesOnline.com, they found two bombs with electronic timing devices, two pipe bombs in the crawl space, a hand grenade, various chemicals used to manufacture explosives, as well as detailed books on how to construct bombs. Finally, the home was cleared, and authorities were able to continue with the investigation. During the removal of Faith Kinkle's remains, another bomb was discovered to be hidden under her body. The investigation team evacuated the house once again, and the bomb crews headed back in. As far as I could gather, this was the last bomb found in the home. I'm not sure if these explosives were supposed to go off or not. I can't really think of another reason why he would hide one under his mother's body. But I'd like to know what you think. A note written by Kinkle was found on the living room coffee table. It read, quote, I have just killed my parents. I don't know what is happening. I love my mom and dad so much. I just got two felonies on my record. My parents can't take that. It would destroy them. The embarrassment would be too much for them. They couldn't live with themselves. The note continues, quote, I'm so sorry. I am a horrible son. I wish I had been aborted. I destroy everything I touch. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I didn't deserve them. They were wonderful people. It's not their fault or the fault of any person, organization, or television show. My head just doesn't work right. God damn these voices inside my head. I want to die. I want to be gone. But I have to kill people. I don't know why. I am so sorry. Why did God do this to me? I have never been happy. I wish I was happy. I wish I made my mother proud. I am nothing. I tried so hard to find happiness. But you know me. I hate everything. I have no other choice. What have I become? I am so sorry. Kinkle's journal entries were also discovered in his room. Some of them were just sad notes, but most were full of incredibly violent threats, mainly talking about killing those around him. They offer even more insight to his unstable state of mind. There are a few mentions of an unnamed girl in his writings, possibly the girl he had a relationship with previously. He also talks about a specific person he wanted to kill, but I'm not sure who he's talking about there. An entry of his read, quote, I sit here all alone. I am always alone. I don't know who I am. I want to be something I can never be. I try so hard every day. But in the end, I hate myself for what I've become. Every single person I know means nothing to me. I hate every person on this earth. I wish they could all go away. You all make me sick. I wish I was dead. The only reason I stay alive is because of hope. Even though I am repulsive, and few people know who I am, I still feel that things might maybe just a little bit get better. I don't understand any fucking person on this earth. Some of you are so weak mainly, that a four-year-old could push you down. I am strong, but my head just doesn't work right. I know I should be happy with what I have, but I hate living. Every time I talk to her, I have a small amount of hope. But then she will tear it right down. It feels like my heart is breaking. But is that possible? I am so consumed with hate all of the time. Could I ever love anyone? I have feelings, but do I have a heart that's not black and full of animosity? His entry continues, quote, I know everyone thinks this way sometimes, but I am so full of rage that I feel I could snap at any moment. I think about it every day. Blowing the school up or just taking the easy way out and walking into a pep assembly with guns. In either case, people that are breathing will stop breathing. That is how I will repay all you motherfuckers for all you put me through. I feel like everyone is against me, but no one ever makes fun of me, mainly because they think I am a psycho. There is one kid above all others that I want to kill. I want nothing more than to put a hole in his head. The one reason I don't, hope, that tomorrow will be better. As soon as my hope is gone, people die. I ask myself why I hate more than anyone else. I don't know but my head and heart want him dead. He only knows who I am through reputation, and I know he is scared of me. He should be. One bad day, and there will be a sawed-off shotgun in his face or five pounds of Semtex under his bed. I need help. There is one person that could help, but she won't. I need to find someone else. I think I love her, but she could never love me. I don't know why I try. He continues on, quote, Oh fuck, I sound so pitiful. People would laugh at this if they read it. 
I hate being laughed at, but they won't laugh after they're scraping parts of their parents, sisters, brothers, and friends from the wall of my hate. Please, someone, help me. All I want is something small, nothing big. I just want to be happy. End. New day. Today of all days, I ask her to help me. I was shot down. I feel like my heart has been ripped open and ripped apart. Right now I'm drunk, so I don't know what the hell is happening to me. It is clear that no one will help me. Oh God, I am so close to killing people. So close. I gave her all I have, and she just threw it away. Why? Why did God just want me to be in complete misery? I need to find more weapons. My parents are trying to take away some of my guns. My guns are the only things that haven't stabbed me in the back. Kinkle went on writing, quote, My eyes hurt. They hurt so bad. They feel like they are trying to crawl out of my head. Why aren't I normal? Help me. No one will. I will kill every last motherfucking one of you. The thought of you is still racing in my head. I am too drunk to make sense. Every time I see your face, my heart is shot with an arrow. I think she will say yes, but she doesn't, does she? She says, I don't know. The three most fucked up words in the English language. I want you to feel this, be this, taste this, kill this, kill me. Oh God, I don't want to live. Will I see it to the end? What kind of dad would I make? All humans are evil. I just want to end the world of evil. I don't want to see, hear, speak, or feel evil, but I can't help it. I am evil. I want to kill and give pain without a cost, and there is no such thing. We kill him. We killed him a long time ago. Anyone that believes in God is a fucking sheep. If there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. Love isn't real, only hate remains. Only hate. Also found in his room was a piece of schoolwork, with a prompt talking about love at first sight. Kinkle's response to the topic was, quote, Love sucks. No, I don't believe in love at first sight, because love is an evil plot to make people buy alcohol and firearms. When you love someone, something is always taken away from you. I also would like to add that I hate each and every one of you, because everything I touch turns to shit. I think if you think you fall in love with someone at first sight, it might just be lust. Love at first sight is only in movies, where the people in the movies are better than you. That is why you go to a pawn shop and buy an AK-15 because you are going to execute every last motherfucking one of you. If I had a heart, it would be gray. It continues, quote, It is easier to hate than love, because there is much more hate and misery in the world than there is love and peace. Some people say that you should love everyone, but that is impossible. Look at our history. It is full of death, depression, rape, wars, and diseases. I also do not believe in love at first sight, but I do believe in hate at first sight. Therefore, love is a much harder feeling to experience. I really wouldn't know how to answer this question because my cold black heart has never and never will experience true love. I can tell you one thing about love. It does more harm than good. I plan to live in a big black hole. My firearms and blank will be the only things to fight my isolation. I would also like to point out, love is a horrible thing. It makes things kill and hate. The investigation at the Kinkle residence was wrapped up. Kinkle's court process soon began, and it was decided that he would be tried as an adult. On September 24, 1999, three days before the jury selection was scheduled to happen, Kinkle pleaded guilty to his many charges of attempted murder and murder. This meant that he would have no chance to be acquitted due to reasons of insanity. Kinkle's journal entries were read aloud, during which he kept his head tucked into his arms, hiding his face. Some of the injured students as well as family members of the injured and deceased students spoke out about the horrific events. I wanted to include parts of their statements that they made before the judge. Please note that these are not the entire statements, just portions of them. This section is a little long, but I found their statements to be so powerful, and I definitely wanted to share them. Ben Walker's father, Mark Walker, made an absolutely heartbreaking statement. He said, quote, Good morning, Your Honor. I apologize for restating the obvious, but I would like to say, Mr. Kinkle murdered four people and attempted to murder many others. He was selective and warned people he thought to be friends away from the school that morning. 
The account of my son's death as it was related to me indicated Mr. Kinkle walked past my son in the hall, turned, put his gun to the back of my son's head, and killed him. This was cold-blooded murder, not the random act of rage Mr. Kinkle would have us believe. His actions were callous, calculated, premeditated, and with no regard for human life. Benjamin was 16 years old. He lost 60 to 70 years of his life, as did the Nicolaussen boy. He continued, quote, Mr. Kinkle's actions at Thurston were used as a benchmark for other young men in Colorado that murdered their classmates. Just a short time ago, four young men in Cleveland were arrested for planning a school shooting. Their friends said they thought it was cool. The school authorities and school administrators are doing their best to prevent school shootings. The sentence you are about to render will send a message to other young people whether they can expect leniency from the law or that they will be held accountable for their actions. I can only plead with you to sentence Mr. Kinkle to a term that will keep him in prison for the rest of his natural life. The law provides for this length of sentence to be imposed, not only to protect us from Mr. Kinkle, but also to serve as a deterrent to someone else considering similar actions. If Mr. Kinkle is sitting in prison without possibility of release for the rest of his life, it might, just might, keep some other young person from taking a gun to school. That would be the only positive thing that could come from this tragedy. Thank you, Your Honor. Mikhail Nikolasin's father, Michael, also made a statement. Quote, There is always something very special about a firstborn child, and Mikhail was that for us. As all the joys of learning, even when troubles become apparent that we go through as they age, but the real joys come when you realize they are beginning to change from a child to an adult. Mikhail was at that point in his life. He had found somebody he wished to marry and was making plans, and suddenly that was taken away from him, and from us, and the places in our hearts that had been filled with happiness, joy, expectations, left an empty hole filled with nothing but pain and agony, which will never go away. Kip has taken Mikhail's life permanently. He has taken a lot of joy from our family permanently, and I feel he should be in jail permanently. Jennifer Aldridge, who was shot in the hand and the chest, made a tragic recount of the day's events. She said, quote, I felt intense heat and pain hit and spasm through my hand. I watched blood splurt and pour out of my two fingers as my entire hand throbbed. Nauseated and scared, I tried to scream, but you had shot me again this time through my lung and blood gurgled out of my mouth. I fell and went in and out of consciousness. She continued, quote, The paramedics deemed me a lost cause. Todd Ferguson, one of the emergency paramedics, stepped over me and saw that I was almost dead. It wasn't until I spit a lifesaver out of my mouth that he finally decided to take a chance on me. It hurt to breathe. My body felt heavy and constrictive. My hand throbbed and pulsated with blood everywhere. I could smell it. I could taste it, and the memory of seeing it still haunts me. I felt so cold, and I just wanted to go to sleep, but the paramedics wouldn't let me. A respirator breathed for me for two days, and they removed it the third, after a few attempts to wean me off, but my lungs weren't strong enough, and they would collapse again. My index and middle fingers are now fused in one place. I will have my hand deformed for the rest of my life. Another part of her statement read, quote, in the summer, when I wear a bathing suit or a tank top, people gawk and ask questions about the scars from the bullet holes, 42 staples, three chest tubes, and hand scars. I feel as if I have done something to be ashamed of, as if I have done something to deserve to look the way I do. I had to alter the way I hold a pen and write. Each day at school and work, people look at me questioningly. She closed her statement with, quote, I hate you. I hate what you have done. I hate what I have become because of you. I hate living in fear each day. I hate seeing my family falling apart. I hope you spend the rest of your life in jail. You can't be cured. And if a medication was found to sedate you enough, I don't trust you to take it. You don't deserve to be out of jail. You don't deserve to have the same freedoms your victims have. I never want to worry about you hurting my friends and me ever again. I never want to send my kids off to school one day and worry if you have been released. I'm tired of being scared. I'm tired of letting you have that much power over me. You shouldn't ever be able to have that power again. Ryan Crowley's father, Michael Crowley, spoke on behalf of his son. He said, quote, Your Honor, you have heard from many of the victims. You've heard a lot of details of what happened that morning in the cafeteria. 
You have not heard from my son. He is a very outgoing person. He is very full of life and energy, sometimes to the extreme. He's downstairs because he cannot come up here and talk. He cannot sit in the same room with Mr. Kinkle. After the shooting, my son told me what he could not tell you. He told me about sitting across from Mikhail. He told me about hearing the shots, jumping down, grabbing the bench. He told me about watching Mikhail grab his thigh where he had been shot, looking into Mikhail's face as it was in anguish and pain. He saw the gun go to the back of Mikhail's head. He saw Kip pull the trigger. He described in detail, this horrifies me to this day, how Mikhail's face changed as he died. My 15-year-old son witnessed that. And if that weren't enough, Kip came around the table, put the gun to my son's forehead, and pulled the trigger. He went on, quote, Kip, you're a bastard. You shot Ben, you shot Mikhail, you shot Ryan Atterbury, all in the back. But with my son, you put the gun to his forehead. He looked at you. They didn't know they were going to be shot. My son knew he was going to be shot and knew he was going to be killed. But you just pulled the trigger. When there were no bullets, you tried to reload. Your Honor, don't tell Kip that it didn't matter when he pointed the gun at Ryan's head and pulled the trigger. Don't tell Ryan it was no big deal. It doesn't matter. You don't matter. A later part of his statement read, quote, don't tell my son that you don't care. He has had nightmares. Last year he missed most of school because he couldn't be there. This year he doesn't have to go to school till 9 o'clock because he can't stand being there in the morning. He's about to drop out, Your Honor. Yesterday was his last day at school. He is very jumpy. He is very excitable. He can't stay still. Everything scares him. He's not the person he was a year before. Worse off, he can't share his feelings. Don't tell him that this is not punishable. Don't tell him that he doesn't count. Your Honor, the effects of Kip's actions on my son will last my whole son's life. Why should that affect my son for his whole life and only affect Kip for the next 25 years? Why should Kip's punishment be any less? Don't tell my son he doesn't matter. Don't tell these other children they don't matter. Kip, I'm a pacifist. I have endured many things without taking a blowback. But if the court allowed me, I would kick the shit out of you. Another student that was severely injured that day was Bettina Lin. Part of her statement reads, quote, I was so very lucky because the first bullet didn't paralyze me. It entered less than half an inch to the left of my spine. The doctors told me if I had flinched, if I had sneezed, if I had done anything, it would have severed my spinal cord and I would be in a wheelchair today. The one on my foot has caused permanent nerve damage. I feel some things. I don't feel others. The scar tissue is incredibly sensitive, and if you touch it, I am likely to react violently because it gives me such awful sensations. To this day it's not completely healed. The tendon in my foot is attached to the scar tissue. My doctors have not decided whether or not they want to do another surgery, because of all the damage it would cause going in there and digging around again. She went on to say, quote, Today, I shouldn't even be here because my schoolwork is suffering so badly. I started having flashbacks again. I started thinking about my own injuries, my own emotional well-being. I thought about the five months I spent going to doctors every week because I had an infection in my foot because the bullet blew pieces of my sock and shoe into my foot. I thought about the surgeries I had, the IV needles that hurt so badly when you took them out, the blood getting drawn, the vaccinations to make sure I didn't have any blood diseases. She continued, quote, As far as you are concerned, I still don't know how I feel. I think that you should go away for a really, really, really long time. I don't think that it's possible for you to be rehabilitated in this society. I wish that weren't the case. I wish that we could go back in time. I remember watching you in Spanish class, thinking that you were really kind of cool, and that I would like to get to know you better. You seem to have a good sense of humor, and you seem to be a nice guy. You had a quirky little smile, and I just wish that I could go back to that. Her statement concluded with, quote, I just wish things could have happened differently. I wanted to be successful in college. I have all these dreams of what I want to do, and right now they're being slowly destroyed because I can't handle reality. I can't handle large groups of people. I can't handle the 4th of July. I can't handle it when a car backfires, and I can't handle it when a door slams. I can't handle it when people come up behind me and don't tell me they're there, 
and I turn around and find them there. I just practically jump out of my skin. I have little to no sense of safety in my life anymore. And there are so many things that I have had to give up because I can't tolerate them in my life anymore. I wish I knew what to say to make you understand how deeply this has impacted my life. I've gone through so much therapy, and I feel like I haven't made any headway with it. I feel like I'm constantly in a box, and that I haven't made any progress emotionally. I wish we could have been friends. And last but not least, Jacob Riker, the one who initially tackled Kinkle, made a statement of his own. He said, quote, I'm not going to ask for you to look at me, but I deserve your respect. I demand it. I don't care if you're sick, if you're insane, if you're crazy. I don't care. I think prison, a lifetime in prison is too good for you. If a dog was to go insane and if a dog got rabid and it bit someone, you destroy it. So, I stand here, and I ask, why haven't you been destroyed? I question myself for not pulling the trigger. I question myself for not getting the chance. I question myself for getting to watch my friend die in front of me. Having to see him die because I tripped. Because I wasn't fast enough to stop you. I wonder why. Why it was when I got out of the hospital, when I was trying to recover, I received hate mail. Why it was that internet sites were set up and fan sites for you. Why is it that people are writing me, telling me how much they loved you and loved what you did? And why is it that I had to be the enemy? Why is it that when people look at me, they think I'm weird? They oust me. I don't understand. I don't pretend to understand. He continued, quote, I don't think you should go to prison. I think the victims should get to do to you what you did to them. I think you should have to suffer in the hospital like they did. I think you should have to lie in the bed with the tubes in you. I think you should have to lie there, with no painkillers while they cut open your chest, cut open your lung, and stick a tube in there so they can drain the blood out so you can breathe. I want you to lay there and look at your hand and think if you can keep some of it. I want you to think about people that have been trying to walk again. You don't deserve to live. You don't deserve to breathe. If I had my way, 15 minutes, Three months of discipline, my senior drill instructor told me that I was the most disciplined recruit that he has ever seen, but I can't stand here and look at you without wanting to kill you. There were more statements made, but I think these encapsulate the emotions felt about Kinkle. Hearing it from the victims really puts into perspective the pain and suffering that took place after the shooting. It was so hard to read these without my heart sinking. What they went through was so traumatic and I'm glad they had the courage to stand up and make their points in court. Kinkle had the chance to read a statement of his own to his victims in court, saying, quote, I have spent days trying to figure out what I want to say. I have crumpled up dozens of pieces of paper and disregarded even more ideas. I have thought about what I could say that might make people feel just a little bit better. But I have come to the realization that it really doesn't matter what I say because there is nothing I can do to take away any of the pain and destruction I have caused. I absolutely loved my parents and had no reason to kill them. I had no reason to dislike, kill, or try to kill anyone at Thurston. I am truly sorry that this has happened. I have gone back in my mind hundreds of times and changed one detail, one small event so this never would have happened. I wish I could. I take full responsibility for my actions. These events have pulled me down into a state of deterioration and self-loathing that I didn't know existed. I am very sorry for everything I have done, and for what I have become. Kinkle's brain was scanned and studied after the shooting, with doctors finding some abnormalities. For one, his brain showed numerous areas of severe underactivity. They also found several areas that had a lack of blood flow. According to AmenClinics.com, Kinkle's brain also showed underlying damage. The main area affected by these abnormalities was the frontal lobe, which is responsible for a person's judgment, problem solving, impulse control, planning, etc. PBS.org stated that Dr. Richard J. Conkol, a pediatric neurologist, agreed with the results. He said that results such as Kinkle's are linked to cases of schizophrenia in children. At his sentencing in November of 1999, Kinkle's defense presented the court with multiple mental health experts claiming that Kinkle was severely mentally ill. According to our Midland.com, experts testified that along with being depressed, 
Kinkle was psychotic and was likely a paranoid schizophrenic. Some sources state that Kinkle's former psychologist, Dr. Jeffrey Hicks, testified that he did not think Kinkle was mentally ill at the time and that he had already been treated for his depression. According to him, Kinkle's symptoms ceased completely, which led to his treatment ending. Kinkle didn't seem to benefit from this last-minute claim. On November 2, 1999, Kinkle was finally sentenced to 111 years in prison without the possibility of parole. This sentence includes four concurrent 25-year sentences for the four murders he committed. He also got an additional 86 years for the attempted murder charges. Almost a decade later, in June of 2007, Kinkle requested a new trial. He stated that his lawyers did not handle his case correctly, and he believed that he should have been able to use the insanity defense. In August of 2007, Kinkle was denied a new trial. He appealed this ruling, stating again that his defense team did not adequately represent him. Four years later, in January of 2011, the Oregon Court of Appeals sided with the previous judge's decision and denied Kinkle once again. According to OregonLive.com, Kinkle has requested a new hearing as recently as early 2023, which was then denied by the parole board on March 6, 2023. As of the time of this video, 41-year-old Kiplin Kinkle is still incarcerated, with no hope of being released. Kinkle's older sister, Kristen, has stated that she has maintained an unbreaking bond with her brother since his arrest. More than 20 years after the shooting took place, Kristen claimed that she never got to the point where she was mad at her brother for what he did, so she never felt the need to forgive him. She stated, quote, There's no way his behavior was a choice. We had just lost our parents. It always felt that way for me. It was kind of like, we lost our parents, instead of, he took them away. Kinkle has also made statements, saying that if it weren't for his sister, he would have ended things long ago. According to DailyMail.co, the two of them both hope that one day, Kinkle will be granted release from prison. Jacob Riker made a full recovery and was awarded for his immense bravery. At 18 years old, he joined the Marine Reserves. Jacob's actions on that horrific day saved countless lives. If he had not gone after Kinkle the way he did, at the time he chose to, many more lives would have been lost. I am so grateful for the strength and bravery he exhibited on that day. He and his high school sweetheart, Jennifer Aldridge, who was also injured in the shooting, went on to get married and have two children. As of now, the two of them have gotten a divorce. Ryan Atterbury, the student who was shot in the cheek in the hallway, went on to work in the Springfield school system. The bullet that struck him still resides in his body, as doctors found it too risky to remove. Many others continue to live with the haunting memories of that day. Now I want to talk a little about the four victims who sadly did not make it. William Philip Kinkle was born on October 29, 1938, and was 59 years old when he was killed by his son. He was originally from Twin Falls, Idaho. He graduated from Linfield College in 1961, and then went on to complete his master's degree at the University of Oregon. Like previously stated, William worked at multiple schools during his career, the last being Thurston High School, which he worked at from 1964 to 1991. Faith Marie Kinkle was killed at the age of 57 and was born on May 8, 1941. She lived in Ohio and went on to graduate from Bowling Green State University in 1963. William and Faith met in the 1960s while William was on a business trip in Ohio. Faith at the time was teaching in Ohio and William eventually convinced her to move to Oregon. Faith settled into life in the new state and began teaching Spanish and French in Eugene, Oregon. The two of them married in 1972, before having their first child, Kristen in 1976, and their second, Kip in 1982. Faith began a new job in 1989, but quickly moved to teaching Spanish at Springfield High School in 1990, where she was still working at the time of her death. Their lives were cut short by their own son. Benjamin Allen Walker was only 16 years old at the time of his death, born on October 4, 1981. According to his obituary, Ben was a typical happy-go-lucky teenager. He was described by friends as easygoing and always happy. Ben had moved from Southern Oregon to Springfield only a year prior to his death. Before the move, 
he had lived with his father, who was raising him as a single dad. He decided to move up to Springfield after a trip to visit his mom. While there, he met a girl who he fell in love with. Ben decided to transfer to Thurston to be with her. Ben was said to have loved Ace Ventura movies and enjoyed playing Final Fantasy VII, a role-playing video game. Ben's father stated after his son's death, quote, Eventually, you kind of get used to the concept that your son is no longer here. But damn, it doesn't mean it hurts any less. He recalled the distressing time in the hospital following the shooting. Quote, From the time your child is born, you spend every waking moment trying to make sure they're protected and safe. There is nothing more overwhelming than to sit there in the ICU, wishing you can help your kid, and knowing there's nothing you can do. Ben was pronounced dead not long after he made it to the hospital. Mikhail Nikolaosin was born on December 26, 1980, making him 17 years old at the time of his death. Initially, Mikhail was planning to attend another high school, but according to OregonLive.com, his parents thought Thurston would be a better and safer school to attend. He and his sister, Erin, went to the school together. Even at the young age of 17, Mikhail was engaged to a girl at his school, with plans for them to be married soon. His fiancée, Michelle Calhoun, recalled that Mikhail would often be on his computer all day, satisfied with playing video games for hours on end. He was a part of the Oregon National Guard, with plans to begin basic training in the following year. He was only a junior in high school at the time, so he was going to be serving part-time during his senior year, and then join full-time after graduation. Mikhail had an interest in computers, and even served as a teacher's aide in the Thurston High School Computer Lab. In fact, he actually enlisted as a systems analyst and computer programmer in the Oregon National Guard. On the day of his death, Mikhail was sitting at a lunch table with his fiance, doing his homework in peace before he climbed under the table and was shot. He was killed instantly. Later that year, on Mikhail's birthday, December 26th, his family visited his grave and left gifts for him. His fiance, Michelle, also stopped by his grave with a chocolate cake and sang happy birthday to him. I feel beyond devastated for the families and friends who lost loved ones, and for all of those affected by this absolutely senseless crime. Kinkle said himself that he didn't even know any of the victims, so there was no reason at all for him to do what he did. I can't even begin to imagine what these people went through following this attack. I truly hope that all of these years later, they have been able to heal from this tragedy as much as possible. A memorial for the victims was erected on school grounds in 2003, five years after the shooting. The memorial is complete with a plaque, a wall, and two benches. The plaque reads, quote, This memorial shall stand forever, in memory of Mikhail Nikolaosin and Benjamin Walker. With comfort to those who miss them, with encouragement to those who are shooting survivors, and are learning to overcome both physical and emotional wounds. On May 21, 1998, our community suffered a great loss. Mikhail and Benjamin were killed, and 25 students were wounded in the school breezeway and cafeteria. Seven students helped disarm the student gunmen. Were it not for those students, the THS student and staff who rendered immediate assistance, and the combined efforts from Springfield Police, local area fire departments, EMTs and extended local law enforcement, more lives may have been lost. Appreciation is extended to the community for opening their hearts and offering help in so many ways, from assistance provided by local medical facilities and personnel, to donations and continued support. The courage and strength shown by the victims and families has inspired all and has given hope and encouragement to continue with life after tragedy. Let this memorial stand as a reminder that we all were impacted on that day, with hope and understanding, helping comfort each other for what took place. May we all understand the life-changing impact of violence, and may this place extend the comfort, strength, and hope that comes from a caring community, state, and nation. After debate, Kinkle's parents' names were not included on the plaque. I couldn't find any information as to exactly why this decision was made, so all I can think of is that since it's on school grounds, they only included victims killed at the school. Please keep those affected by this shooting in your thoughts even though it's been so long. There is undoubtedly still pain and suffering felt that's associated with this tragic event. Thank you so much for sticking to the end of this video. I hope that you learned something about this shooting that you didn't know before. 
Please let me know what your thoughts are on this case in the comments below. As a reminder, if you'd like to have access to perks like viewing videos 24 hours early or being able to pick the cases that I cover, please consider joining my membership. Thank you to all of you who have become members already. I truly appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe.